Welcome back to another episode of Better Than I Found It, the podcast that is all things college golf. Today, my volunteer assistant coach, Brian Dolhide, asks me five or six questions that were submitted by listeners. Also, I tell three relatively short stories of mentors in my life whose influence was quite significant. These three instances are something that I'll never forget. I hope you'll enjoy. So, Coach, we received a few great questions online. Um, Let's just get right into it. Our first question is for incoming collegiate golfers. What would a typical week look like in the fall season versus a typical week during the spring season? Well, that's actually a good question. Um, they would look a little different, and, and part of that will be based upon weather, if nothing else. So when you get to school in August, for most teams that are in semesters, when you get to school in August, you can expect uh, that there's a lot of daylight left. You know, So the, you may have to play. You might practice till dark. It, it could be something different. You, you still only have 20 hours a week as a coach that we can demand or that we can expect a player to be working with us. But I do know this, we have better weather in August than you're going to have in January. And that's the case for most universities in the country. And so you have better weather when you get there in August, you have better, more time, more daylight hours. Uh, But uh, there's a lot of things involved that might be a little bit different. One, the fall season is a shorter schedule, generally. Most teams have three, four, or maybe five events. In the spring, they have probably as many as five, six, seven, or eight events. And again, the weather plays a big part in that. It's different for every team around the country, but but I would say that uh, managing your time is going to be really big. And so you know you're going to have 20 hours from the coach, and then you've got school, and then you've got studying and tutors and whatever. So I, I think the difference in the fall and the spring is the amount of daylight and the probably the weather beginning the semester. By the time you're ending the first semester, most schools it's starting to get kind of cool. When you start the next semester, it can be a lot cooler. And then by the time you get to postseason, you know, you're getting into good weather. So basically manage your time and the weather and the time of day that we have. So, Coach, another question we got was, what are the off-season responsibilities for your collegiate athletes? Okay, so you're just what the coaches could expect from them, or is that sort of the response? Okay, all right. Um, Well, this is more of an NCAA regulations answer right here, if, if I'm hearing the question correctly. It's like, so summer break is from the time we release them in May or June until they get back in August. For, for Baylor because we're on a semester system. And then Christmas break is the end of finals to the beginning of second semester. So those two vacation periods, one NCAA rule is I cannot make them, demand them, or force them to do anything during that time. So the rules, I mean, I cannot require them to do anything during that vacation period. But uh, Brian, since you ask, I think one thing that can be done is I can have a real conversation with a player. So we'll call him Jimmy, Jimmy Smith. Hey, Jimmy, um, here's where I think you are right now as a player. Here's where I think you compare sort of to the rest of the team. This is kind of how you played this year. Now, when you come back in August, I need you to be a better player. And I need you to be improved and more competitive and in better condition and all these different things. So because I need that and you need that to compete for a spot on the team, because of that, um, I think – here are some things that I would suggest that you could do in order to see that improvement. Does that make sense, Brian? I mean, I'm not telling you must do these. I'm just saying these are things I would do if I was a player. Right, right. And, you know, anything from a, a great workout plan to learning more about nutrition to doing some different drills or different practice techniques to playing in tournaments. I mean, if you do all of those things, you're probably going to come back a better player. So, I can't really expect or demand or require them to do anything during a, during a, uh, a vacation period. Mm-hmm. But I told you just now what could be done. I can make suggestions as to things that I think would help you. But there is one caveat here that is pretty good, and that is if the player wants help, he may reach out to the head coach, the assistant coach, 
the volunteer assistant coach, he can reach out to any, any of the coaching staff and say, would you be able to help me uh, if I came into town? Like if I was in Waco on Thursday, would you be around to help me? As long as the player initiates the request, a coach may help them in a vacation period. So, you know, I guess there's a little gray area there possibly, but the truth is I would as a coach – if a kid says that, yeah, coach, I want to help or I want help from you, I will say, just send me a text, send me an email. Let's get it in writing, and I'd love to help you. But it's got to come from the player. Yeah, that's definitely great information for all these collegiate athletes for their off offseason. Um, with upcoming or incoming collegiate athletes, how important is GPA for prospects? Wow. <laughs> Okay, I've had that question asked, you know, by prospects through the years, and I guess it might be different at every school. I think it's really important because I think if you, and I realize some kids are academically inclined. You know, I've had some players through the years, especially here at Baylor, that have just been amazing student athletes, really wonderful students, and others that were a little bit more challenged and didn't do as well. But I will tell you this, if a kid is achieving high on the golf course, a really high level of great play as a junior golfer, and he does well in the classroom, that tells me something about him. For one, he's got a commitment to excellence in probably all areas of his life. Uh, and two, he can, he can manage something he loves a great deal, which is golf and competing at golf, but also the golf, the uh, school part of the, that aspect of it. I, I think, and I've heard this, and people have heard this said a million times, but the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I really believe that. And so if a kid is achieving at a very high level in a classroom and on the golf course, I'm thinking there's probably nothing he couldn't accomplish in college. So it means a lot to me as a coach. I think a lot of coaches, it does matter to them. But I will say this, at Baylor, we've We've only been below a 3.5 GPA, and that's for all 10 or 11 or 12 guys in the team. One time in eight, eight, let's see, 16 semesters. Wow. Uh, and this past fall, we had a 3.55. So I'm really proud of that. I think that's something that you know we've achieved on the golf course. We've done a good job competing and playing well in tournaments on a national basis, but we've also done very well in the classroom. I'm really proud of that. I've heard you ask a few of your listeners what their favorite golf courses are. What are your three golf courses and why? Good question. Now, I think if you've listened to all the podcasts, you probably, <laughs> if you had, uh, you've probably heard some of these little bits and pieces as, as courses that I love. Um, you know, I haven't played all the great golf courses in the United States or even in the world. You know, I've had uh, people tell me about Royal Brisbane. They've told me about Royal Melbourne. They've told me about uh, Royal County Down. Uh, I've never played St. Andrews. I've not played Augusta National. I've been there. So, I mean, there's a lot of great golf courses. You could go down the list, Pine Valley, some great ones that I haven't actually played. But of the courses I've played and been to on a consistent basis, I'm going to go with three that you asked for three. Here's my three favorites. My, probably my favorite golf course is Prairie Dunes in Hutchinson, Kansas. And the reason that I love Prairie Dunes so much is even at, at a very relatively short distance, it's not a long golf course. It's par 70. And the yardage, I'm not positive of the yardage, but it, it couldn't be in the, any higher than about 6,800 yards or somewhere in there. It's not a long golf course by modern day standards. But when the wind blows anywhere around 20 or more, it's as relevant as any golf course you would ever want to play. And the green complexes are some of the best I've ever stepped foot on in my life. They are amazing. So interesting. I think it's just phenomenal. You, you go north on Interstate 35 and you hit Wichita, Kansas, and you kind of take a left. So you're going west about 40 minutes, and it's pretty flat. In fact, if you drove all the way to Colorado, you wouldn't see much movement at all, except when you're driving through Hutchinson. And... Uh, when you get about four or five miles outside of town, you start seeing some sand dunes, a little bit of movement on either side. You're thinking, where did those come from? And then when you kind of pull up to this very understated uh, entrance to Prairie Dunes, and then you look to your right and you drive in, and all of a sudden you think, oh my gosh, this is an amazing golf course here. And it came out of nowhere. Perry Maxwell did 
just a masterful job. And he, he, he built nine holes originally in the 1930s, and his son Press built nine more in the 1950s. And the, the holes that Perry built are one, two, current, current day holes, one, two, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 17, and 18. That was the nine holes he built. All the holes are still there in the same basic form that they were in 1937. And then Press added the other holes. So it's a mixture of the two. But the green complexes are stunning. It, and again, I said it's very relevant, even though by modern day standards, it's not very long. So Prairie Dunes, number one on my list. Mm-hmm. Number two on my list uh, have you ever been there to Prairie Dunes, by the way? I have not. I really look forward to going. Well, if you soon. if you stay here long enough, we'll eventually get you up to Prairie Dunes. But I don't know how long a volunteer assistant can stick around. Stick around. I hope you're here a long time. But uh, you'll love Prairie Dunes when you see it. My second favorite golf course is Southern Hills in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And for obvious reasons, I've I've been on the golf course over 155 times, either as a player, as a coach or as a spectator. And I've watched major championships there. I've coached Big 12 championships there, and I've played U.S. Open qualifyings there. Uh, I've just really, really enjoyed my time at Southern Hills. It's another Perry Maxwell design. Just absolutely, and again, not that long by modern day standards, but really, really impressive. My first experience at Southern Hills was the 1970 PGA. My dad was a club professional, and he was working one of the holes. And so... Um, my future brother-in-law, Chuck Coatney, was caddying for George Archer that week, and George Archer had won the Masters the year before. And so Chuck had caddied for, in the final practice round, had caddied for George that morning on Wednesday. And then in the evening, he was still there watching players, and Ben Hogan came out to the practice tee and spent three hours hitting golf balls. And Chuck called the house that night and said, Mike, I know you're coming in the morning. I just watched Ben Hogan practice for three hours. Unbelievable. He was in awe, complete awe. So I was really excited. Unfortunately, I didn't realize it, but Ben Hogan was actually hurt and didn't feel like playing. He was just testing it out and did not tee off the next morning. So I missed Ben Hogan by one day. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, is right. Um, he did play in another event. He played in the in the Houston Champions Open uh, the, ne- the following year and had to withdraw, and that was the last term he ever played. But I missed Ben Hogan there. But I did see Jack Nicholas, I did see um, Arnold Palmer, and I did see Lee Trevino and have very good memories of that. But all through the years, I've watched several major championships there. I caddied in the U.S. Open there in 1977. And while it has the base basic same feel that it's had for 50 years that I've been there, it... Um, obviously has evolved. It's changed a little bit through the years. It has gotten longer, about as long as you can. And they're landlocked. It's as long as Southern Hills can be right now. But again, some some amazing green complexes, usually in great condition. We play the Big 12 championship there every three or four years. Uh, I really love Southern Hills. Have you ever been there? Haven't been there yet either. You've been anywhere? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. No, uh, you, you should get to Southern Hills one day. And then my third favorite is a golf course I know you've been to, and that is Olympia Fields in Chicago. Um, You being from Chicago, you know it's a great golf course. In fact, Chicago could easily be considered one of the great golf towns in the world. I've recruited there for years, and I'm going to get back to Olympia Fields here in a second, but when we go up there for like a Western Junior to recruit, and you're trying to find this little golf course, and... uh, You've done a little research and you realize they hosted a U.S. Open in 1910. And you're going, wow, okay. But on the way there, just driving through neighborhoods, you see four or five more great golf courses. And you're going, Where? this is unbelievable. Chicago is a great golf town. And Olympia Fields just happens to be my favorite. One of the unique things about Olympia Fields, you could live in downtown Chicago and you could hop on a train and just go on the train. And one of the stops is the first tee at Olympia Fields. So if I lived in Chicago, I would live downtown, have a nice little loft apartment, eat all the nice restaurants there. But two or three times a week, I'd hop on the train and come down, get let off on the first tee, go play one of the most amazing golf courses you've ever seen. And by the way, they've got two great golf courses there. The South course to me is is equally as good as the North. The North is the one that's hosted the PGA Championship and the U.S. Open and the 
uh, you know, playoff event and all that. The North course is absolutely stunning, but the South course, very underrated. The members actually, on a, a lot of members I've talked to have said they like Olympia Field South as much as they do or better than the North. But it's a great combination of incredible green complexes. If you decide to hit it over the greens, you're in trouble, except for 17 is really docile behind the 17th green. The rest of them, when you get over those greens, you're done. The slope is just amazing. And there's pretty good elevation changes, great old trees. Uh, not as many trees as there used to be, but I'm okay with that. Um, and honestly, it, it's held its own. A, few, uh, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, uh, when... Dustin Johnson and John Rahm came down at the end. I mean, I think they just shot two or three under par to get, you know, at, to lead that tournament. It was like, that's pretty amazing for modern day, um, especially the golf course doesn't have a great amount of length. But it does have incredible green complexes. Really, really enjoy Olympia Field. So those are my three favorite. Well, Coach, I'd have to agree with you about Chicago being one of the best golf towns. Um, other than that, it seems like, there was a common trend. Perry Maxwell hit two of the top three. Yeah, Perry Maxwell built a lot of great golf courses. He also built Cherry Hills in uh, Denver. He built Colonial in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he built the course I grew up on, Ponca City Country Club. Uh, the original design, the, the design is no longer uh, Perry Maxwell. I think there are three original holes from the golf course I grew up on as a boy. Uh, they've redesigned it, but it was a Perry Maxwell golf course. So he was, quite frankly, one of the... Uh, I, I don't hear people talk about Perry Maxwell enough. He was an amazing architect. His first golf course he built was Dornick Hills in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And on on a hill that's near the seventh fairway, just at the very top of the hill, Perry is, is buried there. It's a, They have a family burial plot up there. And that was the first golf course he built, and uh, it was a, it's a masterpiece. In fact... I believe they are redoing it to get it back to the original condition, get as close as they can to the original design. So Perry Maxwell, wonderful architect. So, Coach, another question we got here was, was there ever a point in your coaching career where you thought about going back to playing competitive golf? That question was really asked. (laughs) That question was asked. Okay. All right, so no. Uh, I never really gave it s- serious consideration after I started coaching to go back to play. I I think once I decided I wanted to be a coach, I was all in. That was what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, people ask, I, I can't believe that question is being asked, actually, be- because I haven't played and competed in so long. The last time I played in the U.S. Open qualifying was about 1990, so I was about 30. The last time I played in an event was about three years ago, a pro-am in Ponca City, Oklahoma. Not really very competitive, the best pros there were very competitive, but I was not very competitive. So, um, I, yeah, I haven't given it much thought uh, at all. Like, would I want to play again? No. I mean, I decided I was a coach, and I decided that's how I could give back to the game. And I'm 35 years basically into coaching, full-time probably. I mean, really full-time, probably 32 years. But, I no, I've given – I do not have any regrets. I don't look back. I had – a few really good tournaments as a player, but nothing special. And I'm coaching for a living for a reason. <laughs> I wasn't good enough. And I think that anybody that tells you, well, I could have played the tour if I'd have wanted to. No, if you wanted to play pro golf, you'd be, you'd be playing pro golf or you'd be working for a living. It's one of the two. And guys that play for a long time, I just saw a stat yesterday that Charles Howell was playing in his 600th PGA Tour event. And I thought, oh, my gosh, didn't he just turn pro a couple of years ago? But Charles Howe has played in 600 PGA Tour events. He's been one of the most steady, consistent performers for 22 years now. And you can't deny it. That's amazing to be able to do that. And so it's very difficult to play golf competitively. And anybody that's done it for a long period of time, hats off to them. I'm better suited to be a coach, mainly because I wasn't a good enough player. But... The real answer is no. When I decided I wanted to be a coach, I've never looked back and never never wanted to play again. Well, Coach, I've seen you hit a couple of swings. I think you might have a tournament or two in you. You get me on the right tees? Yeah, I might. I mean, if you get me up on some about a 6,500-yard golf course, 
I'm still probably okay. I was a pretty good putter back in the day, so who knows? But I am not going to be competitive at any other level. So, so lastly, Coach, how has coaching changed over the past 25 years in your eyes? So how has coaching college golf changed? Correct. Ooh, um, the very essence of coaching probably hasn't changed, and that is your player and his heart and what he wants out of it. You know, I always I had an old saying that I've always used, which, you know, always go to your player's heart first because that's where his dreams are stored. I mean, that's where all his dreams, his hopes, his aspirations, everything he wants to do as a in this golf world or this golf life is stored right there in his heart. So that part to me has not changed. And I don't think it's changed in basketball. I don't think it's changed in football. If you love your players, if you show them you really, really – absolutely care about them. I think that part hasn't changed a bit because they'll run through walls for you if you show that kind of care and, and concern and love for them. So that part hasn't changed. But college golf does look a lot different than it did when I got in. When I got in, probably half the Division One programs had a, an assistant coach when I got in. So really, not everybody had one. It wasn't a given that just because you were a Division One program that you'd have an assistant, not necessarily. In fact, when I went to work for Mike Holder, he had been without an assistant for two years. Bruce Hepler had gone to Georgia Tech, and Mike just thought, I can do this alone. I didn't, and I had to talk Mike into taking me as an assistant. So that's the first thing that looked different is you didn't have as many teams with assistant coaches. Another thing that changed is there's a, a facilities arms race. It doesn't matter where you are almost every school is trying to build a facility to make it better, one, for their student-athletes currently, to be able to train better, to be able to have a bigger upper hand on getting better. But true, it obviously helps in recruiting if you've got a great facility. And it's, it's not just big Power Five conference schools, and it's not just schools in the South. I mean, I think what the Northern schools have done in the past 10 years, but in 1997, when I was really just a young college coach, it nobody had a facility like that. And now you go up there and you look at the Big Ten and almost every school has an amazing facility, whether it's a practice area, indoor facility, and or a golf course, or all three. They've done an amazing. So, and then just across the country, though, you go on websites and you look at the, the flyovers or the video run-throughs of the facilities. It's quite amazing, and this did not exist um, just didn't exist back in the mid-90s. So that part's different. I think if you just look at the quality of a college golf coach, as far as their knowledge base, and as far as you know, the background in golf, that's better than it's ever been. So I think we're getting more quality coaches than we've ever had before. I, I hosted a retreat, a college golf fellowship retreat of young coaches a, a month or two ago at my home and right here in Waco. And so I had about 12 coaches between ages 24 and 28 came here. We, we did some Bible studies, but we also did uh, a long clinic on Saturday of that, of that weekend. And I'm just stunned at how really quality young men are getting into the profession. It's, it's phenomenal. And you're only 24. Our, my actual assistant coach, you're the volunteer assistant, but Mikkel, the assistant coach here at Baylor is 28. And I, I just think about the quality you guys are. You're so much further down the road at 24 and 28 than I was at that age. I mean, you know so much more than I did at that age. I was a high school coach at the time, but it doesn't matter. There's better coaches now than there ever were before. In fact, it was, it was way easy to set yourself apart back in the day because if you were doing the work and you were studying and training and you know educating yourself – you were miles ahead of the other guy that just might be a van driver or whatever. But nowadays we don't have just van drivers. I, I heard a reporter or read an article about five years ago, a, a um, reporter called us van drivers. And there was an out backlash of a lot of coaches really got upset about that because it's like, we are, we want to show you we're more than van drivers. We actually know the game. We are actually teaching and inspiring young men to be better. I'm very, very proud of this profession. I love the coaches we have in here. And every single year, it seems like better and more really great coaches enter the profession. So that looks different than it did 25 years ago. The 
the travel, the way we travel is a little bit different. It was almost always in a van back in those days. So there's more flying going on. There's even private aircraft being used. Uh, fundraising has changed. So almost every school is able to, and that, that go, coincides with the arms race, if you will. Um, and I think CEOs of companies, they all went to college and they all play golf. So they want their university team, their golf team at their university where they graduated, their alma mater, they want those teams to be successful. So I think the expectation is a little higher. I think the athletic director's expectation for what you do as a, with a program is higher than it used to be. In other words, you can't just skate through a 25-year career and be average all the time or below average. You have to kind of produce. And I think that – I'm rambling here. Are you okay with that? This is great. Okay. I love it. Well, and I think that academics have become a big part of it. The Academic All-Americans, the Academic Awards, the Golf Coaches Association of America puts out. I think academics have been a real big part of this. So I think that's great. Um, now, it does look different. College golf in general looks different for a lot of different reasons. One, we're, we, we've experienced two years of a pandemic now. So that's changed the look of college golf a little bit about how, you know, it just that's changed. We all know that. But it's changed the look of just about every profession or industry, correct? Right. Okay, I already talked about the facilities arms race. but So you've got uh, the Alston case, which is where we're able to actually pay student-athletes for – for academics, if you will, uh, name, image, and likeness, NIL has changed the look of it, and the transfer portal. I mean, the transfer portal is a is a different animal. That's completely different. I'm okay with it. I'm fine with it. But it is something where kids, uh, if I could have one change to that transfer portal, it would be that the player, the prospect, or the actual player should have to come in and have a meeting with a coach and an administrator just to say, hey, I want to leave. Okay, that's fine. If you want to leave, you can go. That would be the only change I would make. But the transfer portal is fine. It gives kids opportunity. So um, all those things make college golf look a little different than it did 25 years ago. But there's one other thing, and that is recruiting. Um, So all the things I've just talked about have changed recruiting too because now you have better and more motivated college coaches recruiting kids, and they're going and doing more recruiting. Uh, Now we're limited to 45 days in Division I for a year, for a full year, 12 months. But – uh, we are recruiting more than we did 25 years ago. In fact, the coaches that recruited a lot back then were getting all the players. Nowadays, they're getting spread out a little bit. There's a little more parity. So if I could say that, there's more more teams that have a chance to win the national championship than 25 years ago um, because there's more quality teams, more quality coaches, better facilities, better training. I mean, all these things lead to college golf's a better experience now than it was back then, I believe. Um, the, the other thing is uh, the Division I Men's National Championship going to match play at the final has changed the look of it. That means we've had a few more events in college golf during the regular season that are actually match play. We have a Big 12 match play championship in the fall, which is great. So match play has changed it. And then television. We now have 15 events going to be televised this year in college golf. I think it's fantastic, including the national championship for both men and women. And if, if you looked at it, the women's college game has changed immeasurably since I got in 25 years ago. When I got in 25 years ago, most women's coaches were part-time. And nowadays, they're, they're getting after it. There's some great, great coaches doing a fantastic job. And the same as the men, raising money, uh, raising the level of expectation, uh, raising the level of golf. I mean, so both men's and women's golf have seen – a great transformation in the last 25 years. I'm, I'm glad I'm still a part of it. I would love to do this for 10 more years. You know, I'm not going to, I don't have as much highway in front of me as you do. <laughs> Most of it's behind me, but I'm okay with that. Uh, and I have seen a lot of changes. Yep. Well, I really appreciate that. And for current and aspiring college golf coaches, that was extremely useful. Um, thanks to everybody for those questions. This is actually a great segue into another topic um, that we thought would be great for our listeners. Um, You've had countless people inspire you in your life. Can you share a few of those stories for your listeners? Wow. Yes, I I love that. I'm I'm a big believer in mentorship. I'm a big believer in uh, everyone who's in a position of leadership or authority should 
understand they're going to be a mentor at some point in time. You're going to be. And you're going to have, uh, whether it's God leading those people in across your path so that you have an opportunity to mentor, if it's just happened, who, however you want to look at it, you're going to be mentoring. But if I think about it, every student athlete should want to be mentored. You should want to have somebody that can help you th- through these struggles. or through. So I've got three examples today. They're very short stories. They're not long, but they were very poignant to me in my life and th- ones I've remembered. And these are people outside my own personal family, but they are people who made a real impact at a time when maybe I needed that impact. And so anyway, I want to tell these three stories. The first one is Sister Miriam Teresa. She was my first grade teacher at St. Mary's School in 1965-66. So I'm a, a first grader. I'm young. And in those days, very few kids knew subtraction and, and uh, addition or even the alphabet when they got to first grade. Nowadays, I believe the kids are learning all that well before they get to the first grade so that they hit the ground running. But the one thing I remember about Sister Miriam Teresa was taking us through our ABCs and addition and subtraction. I remember that very well that year. I can remember where I sat in the class. I mean, I, I remember I have, as you would probably imagine, a freak, freakish memory. Uh, and some of that's leaving me. But Sister Mary Teresa is not leaving me. And something she taught us that year, besides uh, subtraction, addition, and the alphabet, that I've remembered for 56 years, is this. Every day when she was teaching, and she was our only teacher, if a siren was going off like an ambulance was driving by the school headed someplace, we would stop everything we did, and everybody would bow their heads, and she would pray. And she would pray for the ambulance driver to be safe and get the people there safely. She would pray for the doctors to treat this person well. And then she'd pray, pray for the person, him or herself, that they would recover and get through this. And that was something I didn't even realize at the time. But every single time I've heard an ambulance since 1966 uh, or seen one, I think of Sister Miriam Teresa, and I say a very quick prayer for the ambulance driver, for the person who's being fixed, and for the doctors. So that was something I haven't forgotten. That's been 56 years of my life. Wow, Coach. That's a great story. My dad actually would do the same thing growing up. Seriously? Yep. So I know you said you have some more inspiring stories, and that truly is one. Let's hear another. Okay. So... My dad was a club professional. I think a lot of people know that. Uh, He was the head golf professional at the Ponca City Country Club from 1957 to 1982. And he had three or four other jobs before that. And um, so he was a longtime member of the PGA of America. He was uh, a a club professional. He played some competitive golf, obviously. But but, and there's there's a, a fraternity within the club professionals that's pretty special. And definitely was special in those days. And my dad used to host a tournament called the Cherokee Strip Pro-Am. And it raised money for uh, the Opportunity Center in Ponca City. And it's still a great event. It's still going on today. It's one of the longest running Pro-Ams in the world, actually. And they still raise money. My good friend David Kinsinger has taken over the lead in the last 10 years to kind of keep the tournament going and it's thriving. So here it, it was started in 1962 and here it is 2022. So, you know, it's, it's been a long time, but in that event, in those days, the club professionals still walked. So their amateur partners would ride. So you'd have four amateur partners with two carts and then we would have a club professional or mini tour professional and, or even a PGA tour professional. Doug Sanders played in the event. Uh, Bob Tway played in the event. There were, there were some guys, you know, it was just a satellite event you could play in. It wasn't a lot of money. I think $3,000 was the first prize. But you had these professionals who would walk. So my dad would get somebody to be a caddy master. And he would have uh, 50 caddies there that week. And the kids would be out of school and some of them would be adults, mostly kids. I was one of those caddies. And with my dad being the head pro, I used to get to pick who I wanted to be. And, I, and for about a three-year period, I picked a guy named Joe Walser. Uh, who was one of the founders, co-founders of Landmark Corporation. Joe was an Oklahoma State alum and a a longtime club professional in Oklahoma City. And 
just really an amazing guy. Um, and a good friend of my dad's. Joe's son, Jeff, was my brother Tim's best friend. So anyway, I would always pick Joe Walsh. I wanted to caddy for Joe. And I remember that first year, um, I was very young. The golf bag was as big as I was and was very heavy. It was a staff bag. And I can remember we had gone about, I, caddied the, I was caddying 36 holes. And so we'd, it was in the afternoon round, and I'd already caddied in the morning. And, and I just about 14 holes in, I could barely. And he threw the bag on the back of the cart and said, why don't you just hand me the clubs? <laughs> but Joe took care of me there, and I got through that day. But the following year, I uh, requested a, a man named Buddy Phillips. And Buddy was a really good player. He was the head pro at Cedar Ridge Country Club in Tulsa. Had a son, Tracy Phillips, who was one of the little best little junior golfers in the country. Wasn't a big kid, but boy, he had one of the... In fact, I'm going to go on record as saying, I have known two players that had what I would consider world-class short games. One of them was Sean Einhouse, who played for me at Oklahoma State. World-class. But even better than Sean's short game was Tracy Phillips, who ended up being one of the first AJGA junior All-Americans, won... The polo did a lot of great things, went to Oklahoma State and played golf there. But Tracy had an amazing short game as well. His dad, Buddy, was one of those club pros playing in the 1974 Cherokee Strip. And so I was really excited. I caddied the first day. Buddy played a nice round of golf. And we were set for the next round. And uh, it was in the morning. Shotgun started at 8 o'clock. We played two holes. And the third hole, he hit his tee ball. And then a storm blew in. And we marked his position of his golf ball and we raced to the clubhouse and the delay was about an hour and then they finally said it's going to rain all day long the golf course is going to be unplayable and we're calling off the morning round and the afternoon round well in those days uh the club pro um you kind of piecemealed things it's like you you paid your entry fee to play in the tournament but if you wanted a cart you had to pay for a cart and if you wanted uh, a caddy, you had to pay for the caddy, and you, uh, there were some, even range balls, I think, cost 50 cents for a bucket or whatever, but the point is, is it wasn't all inclusive in the, in the entry, but because of that, the morning and afternoon rounds of the second day were canceled. My dad got none of the 13 carts he owned got rented out, and the fleet of carts that he had rented from Wichita, another 50 or so carts, did not get rented out. Well, he was uh, he was on the bill. He was on the hook for that money. And so Buddy Phillips, on his own, realized once the tournament was canceled, he, he made sure none of the club pros left, and he got them all together. And all 50 or so club pros in that event gave $20 for their cart, even though they weren't going to take a cart. They were going to walk, mm-hmm. and they just wanted to make sure that my dad got some cash that day for those carts that he was going to owe that company. Hugo's rental cars from Wichita, Kansas is who we used to get those from. And he didn't have to do that. And Buddy paid me 20 bucks for caddying, even though I didn't caddy that day. So I look back on that and I think, well, some people would say that's not a big deal. Some people would say it didn't change the history of the world. Some people would say it's okay. It helped Gervis out that day, but it wasn't that big a deal. And why would I be talking about it on a podcast, you know, 50 years later? Well, it's something I never forgot, and it was a random act of kindness. And he didn't have to do it, and nobody expected him to do it, and certainly my dad wasn't expecting it. And I remember my dad with some tears in his eyes at the end of the day telling me that Buddy had done that for him. And when Buddy passed away a couple of years ago, uh, Tracy Phillips, his son, who does a podcast, radio show, or whatever on golf every Saturday morning in Tulsa, had me on, and I told that story on that on that radio show that day, and Tracy had never heard that story. And I just wanted him to know I never forgot what his dad did for my dad because that would have been a financial hit for my dad. But all those club pros gave $20 a piece, even though I don't even know what half a cart was or a rental cart was or whatever, but they knew they wanted to offset uh, that. And I never forgot that, and I got paid for a round of golf I never caddied. So Buddy Phillips, I'll never forget that, 1974. That's amazing, Coach. Um I know we could sit here all day talking about stories. Uh, I know you have one more, so let's get into it. Absolutely. Okay, so another gentleman that probably never knew that it made this big an impact on me, but it was 1982. I had just graduated from college, turned pro that summer at the Kansas Open, 
And uh, I remember I made $38.33 in my first pro tournament. I didn't make the cut, (laughs) but I didn't make very much. Well, um, I played in the Cherokee Strip Pro-Am that fall, uh, first time I ever got to play in as a professional. And, but that later that fall, the tour qualifying. And at the time, I think it was $2,000 for the entry for the, but it was August 1st. I had not yet entered and I didn't have a dime. So I went to my dad and said, dad, I don't want to ask you for this money. I want you to give me some advice as to how I would get this money. It, it costs $2,000. I don't have any. He says, well, Mike, I mean, I said, no, Dad, I don't want to take it from you. I want to go out and, and get it. How would I do it? He said, well, why don't, you, um, why don't you talk to one or two of the members of the Ponca City Country Club? And he was no longer the pro there, but obviously I had cleaned golf clubs, picked up range balls, uh, washed carts, vacuumed at the golf shop. I had worked at the Ponca City Country Club since I was 10, so it was 12 years. I'd made a lot of relationships and built lots of relationships there. And so I started thinking about people, and I asked my dad I said, the next day, I said, what do you think about Julie Berman? And Julie was actually a guy. That was, his name was Julie. Um, they nicknamed him Jules. Uh, he was a druggist. He owned a pharmacy there in, in Ponca City, Julie's Drug. And my dad said, that's a great guy. He loved you. He, I'm, I'm sure he'd be able to help you. So I, I called up Julie. He answered, and he, he was real thrilled to hear from me. He hadn't heard from me in a couple of years. And I said, can I come up? to your drugstore, and I've got something I want to ask you in person. He said, absolutely, I'll be here tomorrow. So I went up, drove up to Ponca City the next day, and sat down in his office and told him my plight, my story, my quant conundrum. Uh, Julie, I don't have the money for tour school. The entries are due in a couple of weeks, and I would like to know if if we could make an arrangement to get the $2,000 so I could pay the entry fee. And he said, well, how would you want to set it up? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, what about a balloon note? I said, I don't know what that is. And he says, well, we're just going to agree here today that I'm going to give you the $2,000. And then the balloon note says at the end of a certain period of time, you just pay me back. So let's make it 10 years. So anytime from today and in the next 10 years, you pay me the $2,000 back. It's yours. Just figure out when you've got enough money, you can do it. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. For one, I'd never heard of a balloon note. And number two, it's like, this is free money today. <laughs> I, the day of rec- reconciliation doesn't come for a long time. I got 10 years, I can do this. So he gave me the $2,000 that day. And obviously, I went and played in the Cherokee Strip, played in a couple other pro-ams, went to tour school, and uh, didn't make it. Didn't make it through tour school, which is pretty standard for a, a young 22-year-old guy. And, uh, but I owed Julie $2,000. Long story short, I played many tours for two or three more years, got into coaching, and then it was 1987. But always in the back of my mind, I kept on thinking, you know, I'm going to start saving some money. I'm going to put back some money. Well, I was making nothing. I had no money, but every once in a while, I'd put a little back. And literally, some people still believe that knew me back in those days that I have money buried in the backyard in coffee cans, that I've never, I've got the first dime I ever made. You know, they they kind of think about it that way. Well, I don't, but uh, I was putting money back, literally putting cash back. I'd get a $5 bill, put it back, get a $10. And it took me two more years but I had put, and I was starving to death. I had no money, was going back to school to get a teaching degree, working for nothing almost at the golf course, junior golf director, blah, blah, blah. But sometime in 1989, I had enough money. I had $2,000 in cash. So I called up Julie and I said, Julie, are you going to be in your pharmacy tomorrow? He said, I sure will. And I, so I said, okay, I'll be there at 10. And so I know Julie probably was thinking, okay, I haven't talked to Mike in a long time. This is probably payback. So I sat down in his office, and I put an envelope down there and put it on his desk and had his name on the front, Julie Berman. And he opened the envelope, and he kind of thumbed through there and realized that there was $2,000 in there. And he looked at me, and he tossed it back down right to me, and he said, what's that? And I said, well, Julie, that's the $2,000 you loaned me eight, nine years ago or whenever it was. And we had a balloon note for 10 years, and I'm just here to pay off today. 
And he picks up the money again and he starts thumbing through there again. He looks at it, hands it back to me and he says, Mike, just knowing you'd pay me back is payment enough for me. So it's yours. And so I started crying at that time because it was like, oh my God, if he only, first of all, it was the gesture that was like quite amazing that he would do that. And second of all, if he only knew how badly I needed $2,000 at that time, it was like, he had no idea what that meant to me, but it was just a random act of kindness. He gave me that $2,000 in 1982, knowing full well he was never going to have me pay it back. It was a gift. It was not a loan. And, but he made it out to be a loan. And as it was, he knew that Mike McGraw will pay me back. And I tried, and he just would not take the money that day. So I've never forgotten that. Julie lived to be 88 years of age. Fun man. He was great. He was loved playing golf at the club. He wasn't a good player, but he loved it. And uh, I'll never forget what Julie Berman did for me that day. Well, uh, yeah, those are just three stories of people who have been mentors in my life that have done things that I remembered. Or it, it, it just speaks to, as a coach, we sometimes forget what we say, what we do, how we say it, how we do it. It really matters with our players. And I don't think a player is ever going to remember you know, that I was the coach of the year in 2009. Or I don't think a player is ever going to remember, oh, we raised this amount of money. I don't think a player is going to remember we won these three tournaments. But they're never, ever, ever going to forget what you said to them, how you said it, how you made them feel, and, and just our interactions as human beings. And I think these three people were not a coach of mine. One was a teacher. One was uh, just a mentor from the club. And, and the other was a, a club pro that was, lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, two hours away. None of them were my coach, but all of them did something that I want to do as a coach, and that is make a lasting impression by doing or saying something that really made a difference in their lives. So anyway, we might even have another podcast where we go through some more someday. I'd love that. Thanks, Coach. Okay, you bet. 